Hello everyone, welcome to week 11 lecture videos. Uh, we continue to discuss capital structure decision this week. We will be covering two chapters, chapter 18 and chapter 19. And we start with chapter 18 first of all. How much should a corporation borrow? As usual, we have a couple of learning objectives from this chapter. So we will essentially talk about corporate and personal taxes. You know, up to the last chapter, we discussed about corporate taxes only. So we incorporate personal taxes this week. We also understand the cost of financial distress and then uh, picking out a theory of financial choices. First of all, in Chapter 17, we found that debt policy rarely matters in well-functioning capital markets with no frictions or imperfections. Few financial managers would accept that conclusion as a practical guideline. If debt policy doesn't matter, then they shouldn't worry about it. Financing decisions could be routine or erratic, it wouldn't matter. Yet financial managers do worry about debt policy, and in this chapter we essentially explain why. If debt policy were completely irrelevant, then actual debt ratios should vary randomly from farm to farm and industry to industry. However, if you look at this table in this slide, you can see that there are a few industries, for example, hotels, airlines, gas utilities, they have a very high debt ratio. On the other hand, some industries, for example, internet information providers, communication equipment, and integrated oil and gas, their debt ratios are 10% or less. So you understand that many firms in uh, capital intensive industry, for example, uh, steel, aluminium, chemicals, they have very high debt ratio. On the other hand, for example, pharmaceutical company, advertising agency, internet uh, information providers, they are heavily dominated by equity. The explanation of these patterns lies partly in the things we left out uh, in the last chapter. We mostly ignore taxes, as I, as I just mentioned previously, and we assume bankruptcy was cheap, quick, and painless. If it isn't, then there are costs associated with financial distress, even if legal bankruptcy is ultimately avoided. We also didn't consider the potential conflict of interest between the firm's security holders, so we will put all these things back uh, in this chapter. First of all, the corporate taxes. Debt financing has one important advantage under the corporate income tax system in the United States and many other countries. The interest that a company pays is tax deductible expense, thus the return to bondholder escapes taxation at the corporate level. So look at this example in the slide. Here we have two farms, uh, one is farm U, another is farm L, and this is the simplest uh, income statement for these two farms. You can see that farm U doesn't have any debt, so its interest paid to the Bondholders is zero. On the other hand, Farm L has 8% interest and interest paid to bondholder is 80. Now, you can see that earning for both of them, both of the farms are same and pre-tax income, however, is different. And if you look at taxes for the unlevered farm that doesn't have any debt, its tax is 350, and for levered farm that has an amount of interest, its tax is 322. So you can see for farm L, tax bill is $28 less compared to farm U that doesn't have any debt. This is the tax shield provided by the debt of L. The effect the government pays 35% of the interest expense of L. The total income that L can pay out of its bondholders and stockholders increases by that amount. Okay, so this tax shield, you can see, as I said, the $28 less paid by the firm L, this tax shield can be valuable assets. Suppose that the debt of L is fixed and permanent. Uh, in that case, L can look forward to a permanent stream of cash flows of $28 per year because as it pays $28 less, this $28 can be used in some other purpose. The risk of these flows is likely to be less than the risk of operating assets of L. Therefore, uh, we also can discount these cash flows 
at a relatively lower rate. For example, as we have the tax yield of $28 and uh, let's say we use a discount rate which is 8% which is equal to the interest paid to the bondholders by 8%, uh, so the present value of this tax yield is 350 So we divide $28 by the discount rate assuming that this uh, tax yield continues indefinitely. So this is essentially the present value formula for a foreign uh, perpetuity. So this 350 is the present value of tax shield. Okay. Now we can calculate it as interest payment. Interest payment is a return on debt multiplied by the amount borrowed. So D is the amount borrowed and RT is the interest rate on this. And present value of tax shield is you can see corporate tax rate multiplied by the interest payment divided by expected return on debt. So this TC is the corporate tax rate. RD is the interest on debt, and D is the interest amount divided by RD. So if we eliminate this RD and RD, what we actually left is corporate tax rate multiplied by the amount of debt. So that's the that's the tax shield, present value of tax shield, which can be considered as an asset for a company. Look at this example. You own all the equity of a Space Baby's diaper company. The company has no debt. The company's annual cash flow is 900,000 before interest and taxes. The corporate tax rate is 35%. You have the option to exchange half of your equity position for 5% bonds with face value of 2 million. Should you do this and why? So first of all, look, uh, you own all the equity of Space Baby Diaper, as I said. So this is the all equity position. You can see earning before interest and tax is 900,000. Since there is no debt, so interest payment is zero. Pre-tax income is 900. Taxes is 350 and net cash flow is 585. Now, if you can have an option to exchange half of your equity with debt and it carries a 5% interest. So this is 50% debt and 50% equity option. So there will be an interest payment, for example, that is $100 and taxes is 280. Now net cash flow is 520, which previously was 585. So you can see that uh, in all equity case, it is 585. And in 50% debt, although you can see that net cash flow is 520, don't forget that you already have paid an interest to your bondholder is $100. So your total cash flow is essentially 620. Total cash flow uh, generated and paid to the capital providers is essentially 620. So uh, this is the formula as we have previously seen. Present value of tax shield is the amount of debt, interest rate on debt, and the corporate tax rate divided by interest rate on debt. So we eliminate these two and we have debt into the corporate tax rate. So let's say our debt is 2 million. This is our interest rate and this is the tax rate. So our tax benefit is 35,000 and as we divide 35,000 by the discount rate, so this is a perpetuity formula, the so present value of tax yield is 700,000. So this is the present value of tax yield 700,000. So you can see that for a firm that's using this amount of debt, it has an additional asset or additional cash flow, which present value is the 700,000. Now, what's the value of the firm in that case? Value of the firm is the value of the all equity firm plus present value of tax shield. So you can see that the all equity value is 585. I think you can remember this 585. That's the net cash flow, 585. So when it is all equity, present value of the firm is 585 divided by the interest rate. So this is the value of the all equity firm. However, if firm uses 50% debt, the present value of tax yield will be 700,000. So if firm goes for 50% debt and 50% equity, firm's value will be 12,400,000. So you can see that as firm has all equity, its value is 11 
million seven hundred thousand. However, as the firm goes for debt, it has an additional asset, which is the present value of the tax shield, the tax advantage or the tax benefit the firm gets. That's added with the firm's value. So for the firm with a fifty percent debt, the value of the firm increases to twelve million four hundred thousand. ABM's proposition one amounts to saying that the value of a pie does not depend on how it is sliced. So what we are trying to say is in the last week we have learned that the value of a farm is unaffected by how you allocate your capital between debt and equity. So ABM proposition one essentially says that the value of the farm is not affected in terms of what's the size of each of these slides, I mean debt and equity, okay? So if, uh, from this MM proposition one, if you consider the far, all the firm's asset is a pie and the slices are the debt and equity, okay? So how big each of these slices, it doesn't have any impact on the firm's value. So if we hold this pie constant, a dollar more of debt means a dollar less of equity or if a dollar le more of equity means a dollar less of debt. So the value of the farm remains the same according to MM proposition. However, in MM proposition, we have considered only these two slides, two slices. However, there can be a third slice, which is the government's one. So if you look at this, you can see, first of all, is a normal balance sheet. Here is the asset in the left-hand side and in the right-hand side, debt and equity. However, now we introduce a third component, which is the government's claim, the present value of taxes. Okay, so uh, this is an expanded balance sheet where you can see that government's claim constitute a part of the total value of the asset. So the farm, the farm should try to do anything so that the farm can reduce this government's claim this, this slice so that the farm has a greater value of its equity. So if you look at this balance sheet carefully, it's a large successful farm that's a relatively little long-term debt. And as we look at the numbers now, you see that these are the market values of the both assets and liabilities. Suppose that you were Mark's financial manager with complete responsibility for its capital structure. Okay, so you decide to borrow an additional amount of debt on a permanent basis and use uh, these proceeds to repurchase shares. Okay, so you can see uh, this is the market value balance sheet. So this is long-term debt and this is other long-term liabilities and equities and these are, uh, the sorry, these are other long-term liabilities and these are equities. And in the asset side, you have networking capital, you have uh, pre-interest tax shield and you have long-term assets, okay? Now, as I said that uh, since uh, you have decided that you will borrow more and repurchase, so look what happens to your balance sheet. Just if I show you, previously your long-term debt was 13,000. Now your long-term debt increases to 23,000 because, uh, let me show it in the market values, uh, because you are borrowing more. And previously, your equity, you can remember, was 299. Now your equity declines to 293, okay? Other long-term liabilities remains the same, 19,000 and 19,000. Now, if you look at the asset side, this is the networking capital, remains the same. Long term asset previously was 290,000, now it's 290,000 once again. However, if you look at present value of tax shield, which previously was 4,603, now the present value of tax shield is 8,103. 8, so you can see that present value of tax shield almost doubles. So why you get this additional present value of tax shield? You are getting this additional the present value of tax shield because you are borrowing more. So it's providing you a greater value of its assets. Okay. And another point you would see that uh, the long term debt previously was 13,000, now it increased to uh, 23,000. It means that you are borrowing 10,000 more. So, and you are using this fund to buy back your equity. So, previously your equity was 299, and if you buy back the equity of 10,000, so it should be 200 and 
289. However, you can see it's not 289, it's 293. So although you have repurchased uh, the equity of 200 uh, of 10,000, but your equity didn't decline by the amount of 10,000, but beca because of borrowing more, the, your value of equity has been increased. Since, since you got tax advantage, your equity value has increased. So your equity value has, hasn't declined by the same proportion, your debt has increased. So that's the advantage of using debt, that you get a tax advantage, and at the same time, because of this tax advantage, value of your equity increases. Now, corporate and personal taxes. When personal taxes are introduced, the firm's objective is no longer to minimize the corporate tax bill. The firm should try to minimize the present value of all taxes paid on corporate income. So all taxes include both personal taxes paid by the bondholders and stockholders. Now, in this diagram, it shows that how corporate and personal taxes are affected by leverage. Depending on the firm's capital structure, a dollar of operating income will accrue to investor either as debt interest or as equity income. That's the dollar can go down either, either branch, like either in this way or in this way. So you can see that uh, when a firm doesn't have any interest, you can see that it doesn't pay corporate taxes. Sorry for the interruption, let's start again. Um, as we incorporate both corporate and personal taxes, this is how the leverage affect. So first of all, you can see in this line, $1 is paid out as interest, and in this line, $1 is paid out as equity income, for example, dividend. So when we pay $1 as interest, no corporate taxes because, you know, uh, corporate tax is paid after paying interest. So uh, this is income after corporate taxes. So it's $1 and the personal taxes paid by an individual is this and $1 minus. Uh, so income after all taxes is $1 minus taxes. So if you are a bondholder and a company pays a $1 of interest to you, uh, you your after tax income will be $1 minus the personal taxes you pay on interest. On the other hand, if you are an equity holder for a company and the company wants to pay $1 as equity income, there, first of all, company pays a corporate taxes, so one minus corporate tax. Then you receive this amount, one minus corporate taxes as dividend, and then you pay your personal taxes on equity. So this is also your personal taxes, but this is personal taxes on debt, and this is personal taxes on equity. So this is personal taxes on equity on the dividend you receive. So uh, your after-tax income is essentially one minus corporate taxes, then the personal taxes, okay? So one minus taxes on equity and one minus corporate taxes. So that's that's the income received by uh, an investor who invests in the company's equity and receive uh, equity income from a company. Now one thing we need to understand, uh, this is a relative advantage formula of debt versus equity. So one minus personal taxes, this is the personal taxes paid uh, by the bondholder and this is one minus uh, personal taxes on equity one one minus corporate taxes okay so what we need to understand if this is the case uh, this is the return to the bondholder and this is the return to equity holder how it can help company deciding that whether company should go for debt and equity this is the this is called relative advantage formula so if this relative advantage uh, is greater than one then it's better to go for 
debt. Okay, the company should go for debt. On the other hand, if this relative uh, advantage formula is less than one, then the company better go for using equity rather than debt. So you need to understand that this is the this is the return the debt holders get. Okay, and this is the return the equity holders get. Now, if this is greater than one, if this is greater than one, it means that the debt holder gets a higher return compared to the equity holders. So in this case, equity holders are worse off compared to the debt holder. That's why if it is greater than one, the company should go for using equity. On the other hand, if it is less than one, less than one, it means that it's better using equity. For example, a look at here that income before tax is one dollar less corporate taxes no corporate taxes so income after corporate tax is one dollar and personal tax on interest is 43 percent so the return the available to the bondholder is 0.566 and the no, one dollar is the equity income corporate tax basis paid is 0.35 so after corporate tax income is 0.65 and uh, the taxes on equity income is 11.6 percent so uh, return to debt hold uh, return to equity holder is the 0.534 so you can see that return to debt holder is higher by 0.032 and uh, you can see that here the relative advantage formula is 1.21 so since that's the case that uh, this is the advantage of using debt is 0.032 so it's better that company use debt in this circumstance so obviously the next question you can you can ask that okay if uh, that's the situation and company should use a debt then why not all companies has a very high level of debt or why not the companies are all debt companies Okay, so we will answer this question in the next video. Thank you very much.